Good day and welcome to our Young Bafana coaching workshop. Now it's important for you as the listeners to know that these workshops have been a regular occurrence at Young Bafana for a good while now. We do them weekly to inform our coaches and empower our coaches as well as further educate our staff in terms of football. Um, However, this is the first time that we are doing a recording of one of these sessions. So please bear with me as a listener if it comes, if there are certain hiccups. Um, yeah, we are going to go through the coaching template. This is a document that we have created for our coaches so that we have a common red line through our academy when it comes to the exercises that we do do and the type of training. Now, the coaches have all received this document, which entails 18 different exercises, and that our coaches use these to create their training sessions. Now, the purpose of this is so that we have a common line of training throughout our Young Bafana Academy, as well as getting players familiarized with exercises that we do do, and also to make it easier for our coaches to prepare sessions as not all of our coaches are full-time and not all of our coaches are familiar, especially when they come over from Germany for three or four months, not all coaches are familiar with the playing style that we do have, but these exercises make it substantially easier for them to, to understand and to plan according to what we want to do at Young Bafana. So in the workshops over the last few months we've been going through the coaching templates so that it doesn't become a document that our coaches just have standing somewhere on the shelf and don't really understand. We rather wanted them to work with these with this document practically in the workshop. So often we've um, we've given them certain football problems via video analysis and have then task them to create sessions via the template with the exercises that we have introduced them in each of the workshops and then to carry these out in practice, thereby making sure that they become familiar with working with the template while at the same time going from what we really want, which is to look at football problems in the game and then create sessions according to that. Now. In the structure of this presentation, um, you will see that there are descriptions and possible rules and variations with each of the exercises. However, for the purpose of visualization, I will stick with the photo of the exercises and not read through the entire description. Rather, I'll explain the exercises with my own words and the description can be used afterwards to um, to add further detail if that should be necessary. There's also a slide on rules and variations, which I will read through. And then um, finally, we'll link the second of the exercises that I'm going to present on today to the concepts of positional play or juego de posición as it's called in Spanish. So the first exercise without further ado is the triangle goal rondo. Now, this is a possession game that we have created um, really to school the player's orientation on the field and to also get them to change the point of attack and play as a triangle. So I'll explain the basic concept with the use of my pen. Now, as you can see, the field is rectangular with uh, under 17, under 18 age group, I would recommend a field that measures 30 or 25 by 40 meters. This drawing might not be entirely according to scale, but I think it gives you a fair idea. It's important for me that the field is rectangular as we want to link our training games as much as possible to the game itself. And a, a field, football field happens to be rectangular, so we do most of our possession games in rectangular forms as well. Now what you'll see is that we've got one red team of eight players, no, sorry, of seven players playing against the blue team of seven players. Now it's possible to do this game with neutral players if your team in possession struggles or to play with 7v7 or 8v8. 
even with less numbers, and that's one of the beauties of this game, is that even with less numbers you can play it, but um, yeah, it depends on how many players you have at your session, what age group you have. The more players you have in this game, the more complex it becomes, um, but the base form is a 7v7 or 8v8. Now we've got the, the red team in possession over here, and we've got the blue team as well in the 7v7. Now you'll also see that I've placed six triangular goals on the field. Now ideally these goals would be created out of discs because when you play with cones often what happens is the ball goes up against the cone it can take a weird bounce or it breaks the goal so I really prefer marking discs for this but of course if cones are the only means present then that's no problem either. Now the team in possession in this case red has got different ways of scoring. Now either they can dribble through one of the triangular goals that would give them a point or they can pass to a teammate on the other side of the goal that would also give them a point. Now sometimes the problem that you might find is that the blue team would only go and mark the goals and just close them down. That's, it's a possibility. I don't think that if your team is primed to play an aggressive ball-oriented style in defense that this should be a problem, but it is possible, especially when doing this exercises with players that aren't used to playing football in a certain way. So in order to counteract that, it could be possible to also introduce a rule where if the team in possession just completes 10 passes or 8 passes, that this also amounts to a goal. Thereby you would force the defensive team to close down the ball aggressively so that not just passing can provoke goals against them. Now, obviously the triangle goals are spread all across the field, um, but as you can see in the drawing, I've made them quite centrally and there's none really right on the sides of the field. The reason for that is our playing style, which is quite oriented on playing through the middle, playing through the half spaces of the field. So that's where I've placed most of the triangle goals. Now, as you can see in the example, red has got the ball somewhere near the sideline of the field with blue closing down areas near to the ball. Now, the objective here would be to switch play to an open side, to the open side where red can then score through the triangle goals on the far side. So if you look at where the ball is, an ideal play here could be to play into the middle and then quickly switch play to this side or to that open side where goals would be easily accessible. By having the goals all around the field, you are encouraging players to orient themselves via the middle of the field to the open sides of the field and to switch play actively. Now, the fact that the triangle goals aren't in the corner of the field means that you're switching play, but you're not switching play from one wing to the other wing, which is not necessarily a part of our playing style. We prefer to have switches of play, but more from one half space to the other, or from the middle to a half space, or the so-called ball far middle. So what we would like here is for the players to orient themselves on the ball far side and switch to play there, but only into the area where the triangle goals are situated. And thereby, you are encouraging them to look for those switches but at the same time you are punishing the defensive team if they press the ball which blue in this case is doing but don't manage to create access to the ball or don't press together now the basic game with the triangle goals the triangle goals were used so that the goal is accessible from all different sides essentially but also to work on the principle of triangulation which I will go with into more detail later. Um, so as I think you have a, a good grasp of the basic idea now how the possession game works, obviously if blue wins the ball they can immediately look to score on goals close by to encourage an active counter press from red or they could also look to switch play away from pressure and really all over the field's goals are, are situated to reward good switches from areas with lots of defenders to areas without defenders. Um, the next important point there with is that players need to not only just orient themselves on where the opposition is and where the teammates are, 
but they also should orient themselves in such a way that they occupy strategic positions close to the next accessible triangular goal, thereby really overloading the visual system and also getting them, which is a large part of positional play that I'm going to go into later, um, really encouraging, encouraging them to play away from pressure and having a purpose to access certain goals with the ball movement. All right, so we'll move past the description. I'll just leave it open for a couple of seconds for people that do want to read it. But I think I've covered most of the areas on this. And we will move on slowly but surely into the possible rules and variations. Because it's important to me as a technical director of the academy that not only should games be given to coaches, but we should also um, always have variations to make it easier, to make it more complicated, according to what your players need. And for me also, one thing I tell my coaches a lot is that I want them to take these basic game forms that we do give them, but really use it as inspiration to create their own games forms from this, their own game forms, and um, really something that is in accordance to what their team needs right now, because no context is the same. And I think where a coach really makes a difference to his team is if he if he um, can manipulate exercises to fit with his current context at the level of application. So it's vital for me that my coaches are actively schooled in this principle. And that's also a big part of what we do when, when I do give them a video to analyze and deduce exercises from there. Not only do I want them to take the basic exercise, I want them to really, um, to really adapt the exercise according to what the problem is that they do find. So we'll move on to the rules and variations. Um, the first one would obviously be that goal size can be varied. Bigger goals make the game easier. The bigger the goals, the easier accessible they are. Smaller goals make it more difficult to score and perhaps encourage blocking the goals. Goal shape can be varied from triangular goals. Diamond or hexagonal goals could also be used, but I would really say at least a triangle goal or a dime, diamond goal because we want it accessible for multiple sides and just a goal made up of two discs would be too easily blocked. Now obviously with bigger goals you are overloading the defensive side of the game at the same time as making attacking easier. So the bigger the goals the more easily accessible they are but at the same time the harder they are to block off with a cover shadow. So if this could be the focus of your session and you want to really make it difficult for your team to defend, then it could make sense to make the goals bigger. The next point is placements of the goals can also be varied according to different focuses. If goals are placed mainly on the outside, this could stimulate a wing focus or playing from the outside back into the center. A stronger focus on central goals would in turn entail a bigger focus on this area. Generally, unless there's a specific tactical session focus, I would recommend putting goals all over the field. Now, that's something that I went through in the previous slide when I explained the concept of this exercise. Um, according to what your playing style is, but also according to what your session focus is, you can vary the placement of the goals, and this could really make the exercise quite different from a strategic point of view. Other, points, other, other possible rules could also include getting extra point for playing through the goal and then passing one touch to the third man. This was hem heavily emphasized, the third man principle, as well as the layoff play and supporting a forward pass. So that is a, quite an interesting rule, I would say. It means that if the ball is played through the goal, then the, if the next pass is a, a one touch pass to a third player, then um, you get an extra point. So you get one for scoring through the goal, but one for another one for passing to the third man. This is something to encourage when working with a team in possession, but at the same time to emphasize the, the third man principle, which is a big part of triangulation, but also just layoff play, also orientation of looking where the third man is before receiving. 
and also supporting the past immediately. This is something that I've been working a lot with with my under 18s is that they play forward, but then that forward pass immediately needs to be supported by the third and fourth and fifth player um, so that we can have quick actions with one touch while progressing the ball up the field with little touches. An important rule to keep in mind is that a team shouldn't score on the same goal two times in a row. Otherwise, what will happen is that maybe if you play away from pressure, then you'll see two, or two players camping around the goal and really just playing two or three times through that to score. Herewith, you force teams to change the point of attack regularly and look for to create access into different areas of the field consistently. However, maybe it is possible to, to use to allow teams to score two or three times to do the same goal in a row to really encourage quick recovery defense, which is another interesting point that we would want is when we press the ball on one side of the field, we get beat by the opposition to play the other side of the field. If you allow the, the offensive team to play two or three times through the same goal, what could happen is that you really force the other team to recover quicker and get into position quicker because otherwise they would be punished um, by, by, the, by the attacking team playing through the same goal two or three times in a row. Another possible rule would be to divide the field into quadrants. A rule coming with this could be that goals can be scored within five seconds of winning the ball and another quadrant counts double or triple, thereby encouraging play away from pressure on offensive transition as well as an intensive counter press which guards passing late and has a good rest defense on defensive transition. So that's an interesting point again. If you further divide the field and create rules to force the team to play away from the quadrant that they are in, or create rules to just encourage that, you can really have really focus on certain principles within um, our positional play that are interesting, but I'll leave that up to the imagination of the coaches. Um, another idea or possible rule and variation could be, for example, something like, um, like having goals of different colors and saying, again, highlighting orientation as the focus point. If you play through a yellow goal, the next one must be through a red goal, thereby also highlighting certain strategic ideas or just plainly overloading orientation. Nevertheless, I think this is a very interesting positional game which you can manipulate in many different ways to, to create different types of focuses on offense and defense as well as the transitions. Um, at the same time, always bearing in mind your principles of play. From here, we'll move on to the next exercise, which is really a standard exercise that I do a lot with my under-18 team. So bear with me while I explain. This exercise is called final third attack versus final third defense. And this is something I use quite regularly with my under 18s. Um, due to the constraints that we do have at our training field, we will always have two mini goals about 15 meters behind the halfway line where the coach stands with balls. And then the blue team is attacking the big goal on the other side of the field. Now, we created this mainly because of the constraints that we do have. We very seldomly are able to train on a full field of 11 and play 11 v 11. We can only do this on the Friday. And this is an exercise I would often use on a Thursday for um, specific tactical focuses. Now, it's, it's simply explained. Blue always starts with the ball from the back, from the coach, and looks to play an attack versus a very compact oppositional red defense. Um, if red wins the ball, they can counter attack and look to score on the two mini goals, which are placed in the half spaces. The reason for placing the mini goals quite centrally is that I want my defense on transition, in that situation blue, to focus on guarding the half spaces in the middle and guide the opposition to the side. Um, therefore, the placement of the goals, quite, goals are quite central so that defensive or transitional defense focus shifts on guarding the middle and the half spaces. 
be it as it may, blue is supposed to be focusing more on attack. We'll have 10 blue outfield players attacking 11 red defensive players. And the focus really is for blue to create combinations to play through this really, really tight block on defense. This can be done in a multitude of ways, really depending on what the focus on the, of the, the session is. Every time blue gets stuck on attack or the ball goes out, um, we start from this basic position that I've put in the drawing and the ball will restart with the coach who plays in the next ball, ideally to the center back. The red oppositional defense will be um, instructed by the assistant coaches and will normally mirror what the opposition on the weekend will do. For instance, if we were to play Ajax Cape Town, this, the team would line up in a 4-3-3 shape with four at the back, one defensive midfielder, two attacking midfielders, and two wing attackers and a center forward. In this example, we are mirroring um, official AFC, who usually play with two defensive midfielders, three attacking midfielders and a forward, as well as a back line of four. And we will look to play through that. Now, what we find in South Africa often is that teams that play against us will set up quite defensively with a low block. So one of the main points for us to work on is to find solutions on attack to play through this kind of low block now, we prefer a lot of use of one touch, especially in tight areas on attack, a high central focus and going from there. But as you can see, this is it's a very difficult basic situation as the attacking blue team really has to get through an incredibly tight block to get in on goal. So it is an exercise also where I will often go in and ask questions or even coach explicitly certain principles like triangulation, deep layoff, or attacking the ball far middle. Those will be popular principles that I will work on with the blue team, while the red team will be ball orient defense, depending on what the opposition does, and will be basically instructed by the assistant coach. I'll move on to the description. And basically, it will be just about what I've gone through just now. Um, the field is about 65 to 70 meters in length. Sometimes, ideally, I would have this a little bit longer, but this exercise has proved quite useful when working with, especially on um, final third attack with the blue team, because obviously with a 65 or 70 meter long field and the opposition getting into a low block, you often get into situations in and around the box and then have to find combinative solutions to get through the opposition. The width will be the full width of the field, and depending on focus for the week, session focus, oppositional preparation, I will be giving certain principles that I want to focus on on attack. For example, if we're playing against Ubuntu or Fishhook, who have a very good compactness centrally, we'll be looking to use the wing, and play the first pass to the wing back. But instead of going up the wing and looking for crosses, we'd look to play one touch back into the middle, thereby bypassing the first, the line of three behind the forward and getting into the half spaces next to the opposition um, number sixes and work from there. Um, interesting can also be the fact that we use this in three times five minute intervals, I would definitely not go much longer than that because it is a very intensive exercise, especially for the attacking team who get a lot of touches and who you want to do ideal, ideally you want them to do quick and explosive actions on attack. So it is important to give rest, but often rest is also created by your coaching intervention, interventions. Now you can either do those in between um, repetitions of five minutes or you could be going for 15 minutes straight and really go in a lot and freeze situations where you then ask questions or explain explicitly depending on the phase of the week that you're in with your team or even um, the, the type of age group you are working with. So we'll move on to the rules and variations because this is really a basic form and from this, you can really deduce a lot. Possible rules and variation. As in the base form, 
This generally is a training form useful for explicit coaching, as I have explained earlier, as it happens very often, as it happens in a very game near space and context. This can, of course, be applied not only to the elements of positional play on attack, but as very briefly faceted above, but also for pressing and counter-pressing. Counter-pressing is generally trained well in conjunction to attacking. However, when training pressing mechanism, it makes sense to let the team that is defending, um, in the example above, play out from the back. Then a certain pressing height can be given to the blue team with discs if available, and the coach can explain coach from there. For counter-pressing, certain rules such as that winning the ball back within five seconds of losing it gives you a point can be introduced. Another variation can be to make zones on the field and to introduce certain rules within these zones. This is a basic example of this. The team in possession, in the drawing on the right, um, the defending team is... Blah, 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 sorry. This is a basic example of this on the right. The team in possession is only allowed to have one player in each side channel. This encourages a central focus in possession. The defending team is not bound to any zone or rule, which means that they can outnumber the attacking team on the wing. Nevertheless, playing on the wing can have a certain positive strategic effect in possession, such as playing around and bypassing a compact central block, or getting the opposition to shift onto the wing and penetrate them with quick switches to, of play, ideally through central zones, to the ball far middle and half space. With one man wide only, a certain diagonal passing structure is also created, as he has no option to play a straight line down the line vertical pass, as the possessing team runs the, runs the danger that the player on the wing, who is also not bound to this zone, gets isolated. Therefore, they will learn to choose the right moment to use the width of the field strategically. Also, there will be an overload of the strategic element of giving inside options for the wide player. In other words, when he has the ball on the side, he, just, he can't play up the line. So immediately he will need options in field or in the half spaces, and he will look to play quickly into there, which also encourages the rest of his teammates to give options there. This is an important strategic element within our playing style in possession. This creates a good space from which we can work on penetrating switches of play within the box width. Now, if we continue, another variation, and this is something that is going to lead us into the positional play element of this presentation. Another variation is that to add a lot more zones and give players zonal restrictions such as that player X is only allowed to be in two or three of these rectangular boxes on the field that you'll see on the right-hand side. Then you restrict players. You will generally have quite a set positional structure that they will struggle with. However, you are basically just forcing them to move more efficiently and position themselves correctly within their zones. Per where you play, just, and how the defense is structured. And so what that basically means is that you give certain positional rules. For example, if the center back has the ball over there at the back, you'd want player A over here to occupy a certain area on the field marked by the zones. And player B should either be on the edge of these zone, this zone over here. Player C should be moving in the central box. So you are really giving quite detailed positional instructions on attack. But what you are doing is you are creating a reference according to the ball position and the positional position. Um, so I'll carry on with the reading. In the beginning, this might be a very unnatural exercise, but after a while, you'll reap the rewards in possession as your players will think about small of the ball movements more consciously compared to before when movement of the ball might have often been too distant and uncoordinated and therefore not efficient. So often what I see with my team is that um, Players in possession come a lot and fetch the ball and often run a lot to the ball or go travel very far distances away from the ball to pick up the ball. And I want to give them a certain amount of instructions that still allows them to move freely but restricts them according to the spaces in which they can do this. So in other words, for example, if we look at the number six over here in, in possession, you wouldn't want them to move out of the central block 
that would be, for example, an instruction of the center back has the ball there. You are not allowed to move out of the block, but then he needs to think about how can he move efficiently within this block to create triangles and to to give options in possession that are effective uh, whilst not moving to the ball too much, which really has a negative effect on your structure. Players should also get a feel of how to position themselves towards one another now, which was not enough of a reference for many before. This zonal grid generally makes it possible for coaches to work from a set positional structure, which can now be worked on in more detail. Ideally, a grid like this would be provided the players with a certain number of reference points, which should speed up decision making to a subconscious level in the game, as they will generally know more clearly where teammates will be positioned or close to where when the ball is in different areas on the field. Now, I think I've gone through that extensively, and it's quite clear of how this exercise works. Yes, it is quite restrictive, but it gives players a reference. And then when, the, when you are in the game, you really know where your teammates are more likely to be in possession as per where the ball is at that moment in time. So it's an interesting concept that Guardiola, for example, uses a lot with his teams that he creates a grid like that. And then according to where the ball is or with which player the, the ball is, the other players are restricted to certain zones on the pitch. Now, when you've done this for a certain amount of time, when you've worked with players extensively in this kind of setup, you're really creating a subconscious level of positioning of the ball, which means that you can then move the ball much quicker and efficiently through zones, as was evident with Guardiola's um, Barcelona teams or also Bayern Munich teams. And you are creating a structure where players are really just making small movements off the ball, which can then have a huge effect rather than running to the ball uncoordinatedly. This is, however, something that I would really work on with players older. Um, I wouldn't do this before under 14, under 15, certainly. Probably go into it with under 16, under 17, under 18, as, as this is quite a complicated setup and requires a lot of hard work from the coach's side. Maybe a lot of explicit coaching also, but also you are creating a positional structure and possession and the rewards that you are going to reap are going to be extensive versus just having an uncoordinated structure and possession. Now that moves us on to our part on positional play, which I will base on what this exercise is like. And in this picture, which was created by Jens Schuster, who is a coach at Hoffenheim, you'll see the, the German national team and how they position themselves. Now, if you go back to think about the grid in the, in the slide before, you will see five vertical channels. You have the outside channel, the half space channel, the central channel, another half space as well as a wide channel. And you will see the ball is in the left half space and the German players have a very clean structure of position. Now you one and you see the names of the players. What you'll see is that like I touched on briefly with the exercise, you've only got one white player on each side of the field. So the white channel, a possible rule there that Joachim Löw introduced is that only one player is allowed to give width on each side. Then you'll see a staggering in possession. You won't see players in line. If you look horizontally, there's no one in an exact horizontal line with Tony Kroos. Hummels, there's no one in an exact horizontal line. The same with Hervidus over there. Ozil, the same, is occupying a horizontal line by himself. Draxler is Muller on the ball far side as well as Götze in front. And you have a really clear and clean positional structure from which the team can work. And obviously you also have a lot of triangles. If I draw now, you'll see that there you've got several triangles with the player in possession from which the team can work, which really makes it unpredictable for the opposition to know where Tony Kroos is going to play the ball next. And as you can see really here through my drawing is that players are linked excellently in possession and there's always multiple options for the player on the ball. Now, why is it import important to have triangles is that the guy in possession, when he plays the ball to another player, you immediately want that, that that player will immediately attract attention from the defenders. For example, if Kroos chooses 
to play this ball through to Draxler. He will immediately be attracting attention from this Norwegian defender, this Norwegian defender, this one, as well as this one. So now if we have triangles, Draxler will immediately, while he's attracting attention, be able to play another pass to a third player, which could in this case be Hector, or Ozil, or Muller, or even Grazer. Because when you have the triangles, the first pass will attract the pressure, and the second pass is to three, free up the third man, which is a vital concept of positional play, and is something that teams like Barcelona have used a lot. A pass into one player, immediately he attracts the pressure, but plays the ball to the third player. Now we move on to the next slide, and you'll see exactly what I meant. Kroos has got multitude of options. He could play the ball wide to Hector. He could put Draxler into space, which is the option that he chooses according to his body shape. He could choose to play an Ozil, or even look to switch play into Muller. And really, you've got a structure and possession that is excellent. As soon as the ball is lost, you've got enough players to counter-press anywhere near the ball. You've got enough players behind the ball to secure the counter-attack and you really have a possibility to access different areas on the field by using little touches and little passes. So this is an example of a structure that you can create through exercises like the one mentioned above. You are really creating a reference for the team in possession from which they can then work. Now, if you look at the German structure in the game against Norway, they were playing against a 4-1-4-1 structure I will highlight the Norwegian players to make it more understandable. There is the forward. There's the line of four behind. The number six defensive midfielder, as well as the back four. Now, if you look at the German player's position, according to that, it's, also, it's really a, quite an ingenious mix of opposition-specific um, preparation, as well as roles that, that fit the players very well. Firstly, width is given by both fullbacks in possession, Kimmich and Hector. The two center backs have occupied half space and central positions according to which their strengths. If you look at Hervidus, he's probably the weaker of the two German center backs at building from the back. So he's been put in a less prominent right half space role while Hummels, as a very strong build-up centre-back, occupies the central lane, from which he can look to build up the game with Tony Kroos. Kroos drops to create almost a situational back three into the left half space, from which he was tasked to really dominate the game in possession and be the dominant quarterback, so to say, build-up player, whilst Kedira, his partner as a defensive midfielder, secures in the, the, the counter-attack in front of the defense. The other German attacking players, Draxler, who was an initial winger, as well as Müller, have occupied the half spaces next to the Norwegian number six, making it possible to penetrate the Norwegian line of four, either via a wide pass and then playing inside which would be an example of triangulation or the third man, or with direct passes like this one that I'm going to show in yellow into the spaces next to the Norwegian number six, making it very, very difficult for, that for, for Norway to recover once the line of four is penetrated. Ozil, as a number 10, is also making runs either side of the number six, occupying his man orientation and perhaps even freeing up passing lanes into Müller. Götze, as the center forward or false nine, is a really strong combination player up front who, who makes it possible for Müller and Draxler to progress the game once the ball gets into them, ideally via Kroos. So really what you can see is that Germany have, have created a structure and possession that suits their players. Um, the strongest build-up players, Hummels and Kroos, have been um, tasked in leading the German play in possession. The fullbacks create situational width while not overloading the flanks. The two weakest build-up players in Hervides and Kedira have been cached nicely into roles that suit them quite well, where they are more tasked with stopping the counter-attack, whereas Ozil is busy roaming through the center and supporting Müller and Draxler. 
and Goethe being a combinative option once the ball goes into Müller, do you immediately have triangles there as well, as well as Kimmich and Hector being positioned quite high to support any sort of penetration that could come from Tony Kroos. So you can see how a reference was created in possession, a game plan according to what the opposition is, and having a set positional structure that really benefited the team. As you might know, Germany won this match quite comfortably um, against Norway, really dominating in possession. Now, if you look at this X course on the next slide, what you'll see, this is a training field that Guardiola um, used at Bayern Munich um, from spatial view. Um, obviously, there weren't too many of these really tactical sessions of Guardiola that players that people had access to. But it's interesting to see the training field that he did use with the different zones. What you'll see is a wide zone on each side, a half the space zone, as well as a larger central zone. So it's really quite similar to the structure in the last slide that the German national team used. And obviously, like mentioned before, there will be different strategical um, references to the players in possession when the ball is in certain areas. So we move on to a video that Alex Bellinger created from which I'm going to talk about certain structural things or also highlight the use of um, triangulation in possession. It's a really a great video that Alex made and really brings to life the, the, concept, the concept of um, positional play used by Napoli. Obviously, have a great positional coach in Maurizio Zari. So we'll now what you'll see over here is the video. As I said, sorry, bear with me as I get used to doing these recordings. And this is a video of Napoli. You'll see a clear man-to-man -man orientation in the midfield by Bologna, which is beaten up by Koulibaly dribbling in, which attracts pressure from, from the opposition. Obviously, the Napoli players aren't immediately available between the line, but the triangle by the third man principle is used. Ball to the first man attracts pressure, one touch into the third man to get between the lines, which frees up Insigne and gets a shot on goal. Again, we'll see man orientations in the middle. Two Napoli center backs are looking to build up patiently, move the ball to each other. Again, we've got the orientations towards the ball by the opposition, players looking to receive between the lines. However, the central player is not accessible, so Koulibaly uses the third man principle again to free up the players between the lines with a ball to the side to get in between the opposition lines from which unfortunately they don't, they don't manage to play on. Again, you'll see the same principle used by Polonia, man-to-man um, -man orientation centrally. Eventually the dribbling in by the center back, which is a useful tool, um, attracts pressure. At the same time, one player wide, Insigne moves infield. And again, the third man principle allows Napoli to receive centrally and progress the attack to a space from which they can have a shot on goal. Again, this just shows the, the third man principle in practice and how this can be used as well as other principles of positional play such as um, prior orientation, dribbling in by the center back, a positional structure where players are receiving on the move, as well as looking to get in between the opposition lines, as well as how to get between the opposition lines and how to use dribbling in to exploit opposition man orientations or even man markings. So a nice practical example of different elements of positional play in practice. And yeah, from there we'll move to the task that I would give to my coaches now. This is something that they'll be doing tomorrow. They'll have to deduce and filter out principles of Napoli's positional play against um, man orientations. Now they have to choose one of the two exercises that I introduced in the beginning of my presentation. Um, how would you adapt your exercise to teach the principles that you have identified as important? And in particular, explain how you would coach, when you would coach, what type of coaching you'll use to get the principle across to the players. The coaches will have 20 minutes to do so. 
So this is obviously quite a short time frame as they've done these kind of things several times before and I expect them to be ready to do it. After that, they will be presenting on this, um, followed by a homework that I'll give them, which will be to read um, Adin's amazing article on, on positional play under Guardiola, Juego de Posición under Pep Guardiola. I want my coaches to read this article, look to understand it as much as possible after the session that we have done, and then we'll make notes, discuss it next week, and um, further our study of positional play. I hope that you enjoyed this brief presentation, that you found it useful, that the exercises introduced to you will benefit you and your team. I'd love feedback and I'll hopefully be looking to, looking to do this more often in future. Thank you very much for your attention and see you next time.